Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Asad Lalji. Welcome to the next live session of Abbott Online. And for those joining us for the first time, a very special welcome. Please refer to the chat box for more information on Abbott Learning and our partners for this session. Avid Online was launched in the response to the pandemic on the 1st of April 2020. Having embarked on this journey, today we are close to completing two successful years of online programming with vibrant programs and many more to come. Although the past two years have faced us with unprecedented challenges, it showed us the path to innovate and approach things with a new perspective. We at Avid have continued to champion and bring to our audiences the very best of the arts and culture, staying true to our mantra, as always, learning never stops. Tracing the evolution of Bombay to Mumbai has been a passion of mine and Avid's popular Multipolis Mumbai series that decoded the past while looking to the future and finding novel ways of engaging, interacting and re-energizing the city we love. Our beloved Maximum City has always imbibed the essence of every culture it has been exposed to. With the series Uncovering Urban Legacy, we dwell into the unique cultures of these pre-British settlers that have historically, geographically and socio-culturally shaped the city of Bombay. Having covered the Portuguese, Irani and Jewish diasporic communities, today we present Uncovering Urban Legacies, the Chinese Heritage of Bombay, presented in collaboration with the Gateway House. Allow me to introduce our speakers for the evening. On the panel we have photographer Vidura Jang Bahadur, founder and lead hairstylist at Chen's Hair and Beauty, Annie Chen, honorary fellow at the Institute of Chinese Studies, editor of China Report, Madhavi Thampi, and they will be in conversation with author and Bombay history fellow at the Gateway House, Sifra Lenton. For more about each of our speakers, please refer to their very impressive bios that have been posted in the chat section. On the panel of experts will walk us through the various factors which have led to the growth of this peacefully diasporic community and their journey. They will discuss the influences of their culture, tradition, heritage and language and how it has assimilated over the centuries. Please note the session will last 75 minutes followed by a 15 minute Q&A in which Sifra will be taking questions submitted. So do keep them posted throughout the session. On that note, thank you once again for tuning in. Over to you Sifra and look forward to a fascinating session. Thank you. Uh, thank you Asad. I mean, I'm looking forward to a really exciting session because we've got a superb group of panelists. Now, uh, what I really wanted to tell everyone, my intervention is really small and it's for my panelists to really showcase their knowledge and what they know about the Chinese. Of course, Annie Chen herself is an ethnic Indian Chinese. So without much ado, I'd like to basically make a few observations. One is that all of us here in the audience have grown up eating Chinese food. It's so much a part of Bombay's culture. So although Chinese cuisine was commonplace at one time, the fact is that the generation of the 50s, 60s, 70s, it was always a treat to go out to a Chinese restaurant and to eat food in a restaurant. You never had Chinese food at home or in takeaways or as street food, except maybe in a Chinatown where it was commonplace to have Chinese street food. Another thing I wanted to point out is that what we consider today in the 2000s as authentic Chinese fare have some of the dishes, iconic dishes like corn chicken soup, uh, Manchurian chicken, even fried spring rolls, I was told, were actually created by the ethnic Chinese community here in Mumbai and were created during this period of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, in fact, and are now commonplace Indian Chinese fare or Chinese fare in our restaurants and in our city. So when I talk about the 40s, 50s, and 60s, I must also, I'd also like to add that this was a period not just of uh, many standalone Chinese restaurants like uh, Mandarin, Gambling, Nanking existing in our city, but also the fact that this period also coincided 
with a very flourishing Chinese community in Bombay. So all our panelists are going to cover all this in great detail. And as Asad mentioned, we're going to talk about history. We're going to talk about culture. We're going to talk about occupation and how well these, this community is integrated with the urban fabric of our city. But the fact remains that there are a few historic milestones about Bombay itself and its Chinese community that I would like to highlight. Yeah. Not a lot of people are aware that Bombay had once had two Chinatowns. Okay, some people are aware that yes, there was a Chinatown in Kamatipura, but not a lot of people are aware that the first and the old Chinatown was actually on Nawab Tank Road at Mazgao. Now there are two little arrows that you will see on this image. One arrow which points to a building is actually the old Chinese temple or the Chinese temple and Bombay's only Chinese temple. Now, the temple actually was uh, established in this building only in 1953. But the building itself is a historic milestone of the Chinese presence in Bombay because it used to be a marine institute run by the Tham family to train Cantonese Chinese, who were the earliest immigrants in our city, basically in skills like carpentry, welding, fitting, and even cooking, because uh, uh, Mr. Tham's, uh, the three generations ago, the Tham, who was the labor contractor for the, uh, for the uh, BISN shipping company, was actually the man who really gave jobs to this community here in Bombay. So Nawab Tank Road actually is the place of the first Chinatown. We still have a residual Chinese community who still lives there. Aisha, can you go back to the first slide again? Yeah. The second arrow is pointing to Mazgao Dock. Now, after independence, of course, already there were these men who were working in the dockyards and they got employment in Mazgao Dock. So you can see that this Chinatown really is one lane and it ends in a dead end where you have the Mazgao Dock uh, dockyard wall, actually, the security wall at the end of this uh, lane. Uh, Aisha, you can shift to the next uh, slide. Of course, uh, this is one of my sources who I'd interviewed. He's now immigrated abroad. And this is Albert Tham who used to be the caretaker of the Chinese temple. And it was his family that ran the Marine Institute in Nawab Tank Road. Uh, the next slide. And of course, we had a second Chinatown coming up at uh, Kamatipura, more specifically in Shuklaji Street. Now, this Chinatown, from the people I've spoken to, it appears that it came up in the late 19th century. So this was where a lot of Chinese families resided. And although there aren't too many markers, a lot of people referred to it as Chinapara. So the locals. And uh, we had uh, a Chinese grocery stores. There was a Mahjong club in this vicinity. There was a laundry. There was Chinese street food. So there was a lot happening in this area of a new Chinatown, what I term new Chinatown. And we still have a few Chinese dentists who practice here or who have their clinics here in this uh, vicinity. The third thing that I wanted to really point out, another historical marker, which Annie will be talking about at length, is actually the Chinese cemetery on Antop Hill. And she'll be, of course, talking about uh, ancestor worship and the rituals which are associated with that cemetery, which the Chinese practice. And uh, this cemetery was actually became functional in 1890. So that gives us a good idea of how old the Chinese community is to our city. So without much ado, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Madhvi Thampi and uh, ask her to really give us some kind of context of what attracted the ethnic Chinese community to come here to Bombay. Thank you, 
I, uh, Sifran, I'd uh, like that presentation to be put up, is it? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, good evening, everyone. As uh, Sifra said, what I'm going to try to do very, is to put the uh, presence, the emergence of the Chinese community in Bombay and the presence of Chinese cultural influences in Bombay, which is really the subject of today's discussion, in a broader historical context, uh, uh, which I'll have to do really very briefly. Um, the first point that I would like to make is, which many of you know, uh, is that the movement of goods and people between um, India or South Asia and China uh, goes back uh, really far, even as early as the end of the first millennium BC. Um, and these connections between India and China were, we must remember, both overland and by sea. Uh, and uh, uh, the um, in the process of the exchange of goods uh, and uh, you know, people, uh, there were Indian uh, traders and others who went to China, as well as Chinese traders who came to India. Um, in the first millennium of this common era, I would say that the overland route was more prominent and uh, in the second millennium, that is from about the 11th century onwards, the connections by sea became more important. Uh, if you see, look at this slide, on the left is a photo of old Kashgar. Kashgar is of course in Xinjiang in the westernmost region of China. And this was an important center for Indian um, trading and financial activity uh, over the Himalaya, Karakara mountains into uh, into Western China. While on the um, right side, you'll see the remnant of uh, what has been identified as a Hindu temple uh, dating back to about the 13th century in Chuanzhou, which is a coastal city of China, uh, which signifies that there was a quite a sizable presence of uh, Indian traders, particularly Tamil traders from the Coromandel coast. Uh, so this is the, you know, early or pre-modern era. Now, if we can have the next slide, please. Yeah, the question that comes now is, how did the presence of the British and uh, Western, other Western powers, impact these kind of this pattern of interactions between India and China? Well, actually, initially, it did not effect, uh, impact them very much. Uh, as you know, the uh, Portuguese, the Dutch and others started appearing in Asian waters from about the 16th century. And initially, nothing very much changed in the patterns of intra-Asian trade and uh, circulation. However, with their naval power and their state-backed uh, powerful trading companies like the East India companies, and with their conquest of places like the British conquest of India, the Dutch in the East Indies, and so on, with uh, all these developments, uh, the Western powers did begin to alter the patterns of trade and as well as alter the uh, you know, the ports and networks of circulation, circulation uh, between China and South Asia. Now, one of the most important uh, landmarks in this was the growth of the tea trade. Uh, in the course of the 18th century, the trade between uh, Britain and China in particular, uh, the tea trade, the Chinese export of tea to Britain, increased tremendously. And this led to a search by the British for commodities that could be sold in China in adequate quantities to pay for the increasing exports of Chinese tea. And the two commodities that fulfilled uh, this need as far as they were concerned were raw cotton and opium. And both of these were sourced from India. Now in this slide, you have a rather fanciful uh, portrait of uh, tea cultivation in China on the top. 
while on the lower left you have a, a picture of the uh, cotton market in bombay while on the right you have a picture of a, a painting of an opium den in china um then we sort of we could come to the next slide which is coming closer to our topic which is how the china trade uh, impacted the growth of bombay um the tea trade between uh, china and britain uh, sort of really took off from about the 1770s and participating in this trade were thousands of indian merchants uh, from calcutta from bombay also some from madras and from bombay you had uh, parsi merchants as well as uh, other community merchants from other communities like ismaili uh, muslim merchants as well as uh, sephardic jew jewish uh, merchants as well as uh, jains and marwari and other hindu traders so while we hear more of the parsis um because they were prominent particularly in the first half century of this uh, trade from till about the middle of the later 19th century but you also had uh, other communities of bombay traders participating in this trade now on the um, uh, picture on the left which you see is of course uh, sir jamsi ji 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 boy was a uh, very well known and doesn't need any introduction to people in bombay uh but the interesting thing about this picture is that it shows him with his chinese secretary or a writer as they used to call them so the fact that uh, you know jamsa ji 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 boy had a chinese secretary in his employ shows the extent of his uh business uh with china which he conducted over a period of about nearly half a century the uh, mainly from bombay though in the initial years he went on several trips to china now the uh, besides jamsi ji 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 boy the other names are all very familiar to people in bombay the sasoons uh, the banajis the wadias the petits uh there were so many families which uh, on the basis of the china trade amassed a huge amount of wealth and uh, you know they created a kind of new oligarchy of wealth you could say in bombay which contributed a lot actually to the development of bombay's infrastructure uh, if we look at this picture in the top middle this is the sasoon docks uh, which were built by the sasoons and you know it was the ship building industry also took off in bombay as a corollary of the trade in china um apart from uh, the there are many many landmarks in bombay which too many to sort of name here which are all their origin to these uh, china traders apart from this uh, some of the china traders uh, went on to plow their wealth into building the earliest instances of modern industry in india which were of course the textile mills uh and here is uh, on the right top right is a photo of one of these textile mills i think it's the indu uh textile mill mills or the india united textile mills which was originally founded by the tatars who were also involved in the china trade and then later i think sold to the sasoons and uh, the china trade was not only important in providing the initial seed capital for this industrial venture but the china market was the main market which absorbed the earliest product of these textile mills which was cotton yarn so from about the 1880s till the turn of the 20th century the china market was in fact the main market for the product of the indian textile mill uh and finally in this slide uh, this is uh, apart from trade and goods there were also uh, the uh, bombay traders also imported chinese cultural products we can talk more about this later but um, from china but here in the bottom you will see a detail of a gara parsi gara sari which has clear you know chinese motifs and was really inspired by chinese silk embroidery 
And we'll come to the last slide now, which is how, how does this explain the growth of Chinese migrant communities in India? Well, Chinese, uh, the migration took place along the same routes as uh, the movement of goods uh, and, uh, you know, ships flying back and forth between Bombay, Calcutta, Canton and Shanghai and other places. And the important thing to know is that the migration went in both directions. Indians went to China, Chinese came to India. On the left, you'll see um, a couple of pictures of the Indians in China. Uh, now, Indians went mainly either as traders, uh, particularly after the opium wars in the mid 19th century, forcibly sort of opened many Chinese cities to um, uh, foreign trade. But there were also a number of uh, Indian policemen and soldiers and watchmen who were brought to China by the British to police and patrol the settlements in the foreign settlements in Chinese cities. Uh, so here you have a picture on the top left of uh, the Hong Kong police uh, regiment of the Hong Kong police force with Indians and Chinese. And the low picture below it shows a uh, group of Indians uh, standing outside the Ellis Kaduri school, which was a school set uh, built by the China trader Kaduris, the family uh, for Indian boys here. Uh, but you also had uh, coming on the ships, Chinese uh, coming uh, to the ports of Calcutta and also Bombay. And sometimes they came to Calcutta and then moved overland and came to Bombay. Um, now, many of them were, as Sifra had mentioned, uh, carpenters, fitters, uh, seamen on the ship who just got off the ship and stayed on in India. But some of them were also quite prosperous traders. Uh, the first uh, uh, Chinese sort of uh, no individual known to have come to India, though he was by no means the first Chinese to come to India, was a person called Yang Ta Chao, or better known as uh, Achi or Achu in India, who uh, was given a grant of land by the Governor General of Bengal, Warren Hastings. And he set up sugar mills and imported Chinese labor to work his sugar mills. Now, the picture on the top right is the, actually the text of a letter written by Achu to uh, uh, Warren Hastings, in which he sort of complains about his uh, conditions of uh, his business there in near Calcutta. Uh, and uh, apart from that, uh, when tea plantations, the British set up tea plantations in Assam from the later 19th century, they also imported Chinese to run, supervise, and also work these plantations initially. Um, then you have... Uh, um, in the 20th century, you have um, uh, sort of people coming and uh, other occupations becoming prominent, like the starting of Chinese restaurants as well as Chinese beauty parlors. The picture on the bottom right is probably what's considered the oldest Chinese restaurant in India, which was the Nanking restaurant in, um, uh, China, in Calcutta's Chinatown. And so, uh, this is how the communities grew, the Chinese communities in India. Uh, initially, uh, till about the middle of the 19th century, there was about the, the size of the Chinese communities in both Bombay and China were about the same, numbering about 500 people. And these were mostly single males who were sojourners who went back to China at the end of their work, working period. But slowly the community grew and in the 20th century, you see a kind of transformation and particularly the growth of the Chinese community in Calcutta, uh, because apart from the pull factors which had attracted Chinese to work in British India, uh, in the 20th century, push factors also became very important. That is, the 1920s, 30s and 40s were a period of great turbulence in China, a period of civil wars and foreign invasions, and a lot of Chinese uh, went outside of China looking for safety. And since the borders were relatively open at that time, a lot of Chinese came over to India. And at the peak in during World War II, I think the numbers of uh, Chinese uh, 
uh, in the at least in the Calcutta Chinatowns were about fifteen thousand to twenty thousand, and of course it remained like that for much of the nineteen uh, fifties. But after the nineteen sixty two war, which had a major impact on this community, uh, many uh, Chinese, both in Calcutta and in Bombay, migrated over overseas, and the number of the Chinese had come down considerably. So I think I'll stop there. And I'd be happy to take questions later. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madhvi, so much. Now, I'm just going to dive straight to Annie and uh, tell Annie to tell me what her story is about. How and when did your family, how does your family history really weave into this narrative which uh, Madhvi has just told us? And when did they arrive in Bombay? So how does it all sort of uh, fit in? Good evening, everybody. Yeah. Uh, see, the thing is, my family, I'm, I'm talking about my maternal side. Mm -hmm. Okay. They came during Japanese invasion. Okay. And of course, as uh, she said, it, there were turbulence. That's the reason why. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you really okay. well. Okay. All right. So because of the turbulence, they all came to India, at least a group of them. And that's how they came and migrated in Calcutta to start with. Yeah. And uh, this is like, I would say about what, 100 years now? It'll be okay. about 100. Yeah. When was it? 40s? Yeah. In the 40s, late 30s. Yeah. So about 1937 that time. 37 was when the Japanese invasion took place. I think and so. Yes, that's yes, the time. Yes, yes. 37, 38 they came. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was the time they came. But so. Yeah, go ahead. No, Annie, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, so that was the time they came. Uh, so like my mom is born Indian and I'm the second generation born Indian again. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, so that's how they came. And of course, they had a lot of hardship at that time. It was not easy for them. Language was one of the most uh, difficult thing for them to mm -hmm. adapt to. And uh, yeah, during that time, I mean, some of the stories like my grandmother said it's it's heartbreaking how they came from there, walking all the way, right. hiding in the fields and how to avoid the Japanese. Uh, they used to come with this uh, gun with a, with a knife attached or the spear attached to it. And they used to go through the grasses to see if there is any blood or anything. That means they, there are people around hiding, you see. So the story is, yeah, some of the story I still remember what my grandmother said that, yeah, and it's heartbreaking how they, what struggle they had to go through to reach India and all by foot. Annie, uh, you've switched yourself off. Hello, hello, okay. sorry, sorry, uh, I don't know, yeah, okay. I just wanted to pick a few threads from your narrative. And I wanted to ask you is that when did your family arrive in Bombay? And okay. when did your husband's family, Tulun Chen of Gambling Restaurant, when did his family come to Bombay? Yeah. And uh, uh, could you show us some slides and photographs of your family here in the city? Okay. Uh, this is Tulan's family. Let's okay. start with Tulan's family. They came during the Mao revolution. The okay. Mao. Yeah. So they came much later. The mm -hmm. uh, father, this is the grandfather, Tulan's mm -hmm. grandfather. Right. He was the judge. Yeah. So that's Tulan's dad, Tulan. Uh, the mom and the brother, the okay. older brother. Yeah. Okay. So that's the time they left China and they came to, I think they came to Calcutta and then okay. from Calcutta, they moved to Mumbai. That's right. You want uh, to move to the next slide? Yeah. That's, that's when they were in, in Bombay. Okay. And that's the Chong Sam she, she's wearing, the Chinese outfit here. Okay. And mm. uh, uh, Chulun is the one who is uh, next to, standing next to his mother, the boy. The, next, next to the mother. mother. Oh. The younger one. And yeah, his brother the, was... Uh, his Dr. Chen. Yeah, he Dr. was Dr. Chen. Chen. That's right. Uh, yeah. So the father and the brother was dentist. Mm -hmm. And Tulan went into restaurant business, as you all know about it. Yeah. And, and those are the three sisters. Yeah. yeah. And you also mentioned that Tulan and your family, you are all Hupe. Uh, yes, yes, that's right. So yeah. the Hupe, could you tell uh, us a bit about... Yeah. Uh, like my dad is Hupe, but my mom is Hakka. Okay. So, yeah. And uh, Hupe mainly went into profession, like dentists. Most of them are dentists. Right. And yeah, because I think 
for some reason they chose that as a yeah as a career and of course uh, chinese we go according to the community or the yeah the they have the occupation according to the community they are in so hupe are mainly into dentistry the hakas are into beauty salons restaurants and the cantonese are into restaurant again and carpentry yeah okay okay but that doesn't really hold true today does it uh, no. maybe in the early generations that's right yeah my mom's time yeah a, yeah. a generation before me yeah that's okay. right uh, thank you so much annie my pleasure. uh vidur i want you to really dive in here and tell us your story when did you really get interested into the ethnic indian chinese community and uh, what really triggered your search because you're doing a phd on the community so uh, can you tell us what sort of uh, made up your mind to follow this trail yes um uh, thank you sipra um for that question um yeah i mean and my my phd thesis actually looks at questions of citizenship and belonging but from the perspective of the ethnic chinese in india um you know i spent a very formative three and a half years in china between 2001 and 2005 i lived in qingdao and subsequently in beijing and frankly china had become home to me and when i returned in india to india in december 2005 i longed to speak mandarin and eat home cooked chinese food and that's very different from what's served in restaurants across india and would you know take the effort to meet and talk to chinese tourists businessmen traveling in india or walk into restaurants and shoe shops run by local indian chinese so my initial interest in the chinese community here was a personal desire to interact with the indian chinese given their link with china um incidentally it was in china that i first learned about the chinese community in india i was invited to a friend's house in qingdao for dinner when milin our host and a student at the ocean university introduced me to a young girl uh, her name was lily and milin very excitedly announced to all of us sitting around the table she is from calcutta um lily ethnic chinese and from india lived in qingdao at that time um where she worked and was married to a gentleman from mainland china and she spoke to us about growing up in tangra of a home there and and she kind of you know spoke about eating puchkas and going to the maidan and kind of reminisced about calcutta like any other you know calcutta person that i know um it was through her you know she introduced me to her family in tangra and i visited tangra for the first time around chinese new year in 2003 and it was very far from what i had imagined it to be there were restaurants and little family eateries jostling for space with tanneries really high walls around these tanneries and and sauce factories the lines between home and work spaces were all blurred and um at that point i was you know keen to do like a little photo essay on the community or thinking of doing a project and i shared this with lily's uncle um you know he simply shrugged his shoulders and he said what is there to left to document and why uh this was in early 2003 and what lily's uncle said still remains with me i don't think i truly understood the meaning of this sentiment but over time as i had started to document the life of families and know more about the community's history in india i've begun to understand better why he felt that way of uh, the second part of his question why is something i've never been able to satisfactorily answer but i continue and this has been a very enriching journey for me uh vidur would, would you like to show us uh, some of your work that you've done uh just run through it and uh, just yeah. tell us the questions that it brought up in mhm um uh, let me share screen um is that visible is the presentation visible yes it's visible yeah okay yeah thank you uh for that question sifra um you know and i'll try and give a sense of the geographical spread and diversity within the community uh by showing some of the portraits of ethnic chinese families that i made um traveling across india so some of the first images and portraits that i made of ethnic chinese families were during the new year in kolkata and this is 2003 and in community spaces like temples or in clubs like yihing um which was in the bobazar area 
in some of these spaces and events, like in Chinese restaurants, um, there was a marked visual emphasis of their relationship to China ancestry and culture. Uh, perhaps this was also in keeping with my interest at that time, especially as I was looking for China in India. But over time, this changed as I realized that for a majority of the ethnic Chinese, China was an imaginary homeland, a country they had never visited or lived in, and the association sustained only through oral histories, cultural practices, and language. Um, this is the Hugh brothers in New Delhi. Um, so I would you know, just carry a box of my photographs from my journeys through China to share with the families and individuals I met. Mm -hmm. They were interested in the photographs largely out of their own curiosity to know more about what modern China was like. Mm -hmm. I would share anecdotes of my life in China, and they would tell me of their lives in Bhagalpur, in Bombay, the tea gardens of Assam, mm -hmm. Kolkata, and of nephews and nieces in America and Canada. Mm -hmm. And these conversations really revealed more about the social and political life in India and, and kind of shone light on local histories and relationships that they had uh, to people in the places they lived in much more than their relationships with China. Um, this here on the right is Shaida Chini. Um, Liu Yongwen is his name. Um, and he was popularly known as Shaida Chini or the romantic Chinese in um, Jamshedpur's literary circles. Um, his collection of poetry, Lakuiro Ki Sada, was released in 2009. Unfortunately, um, Shada Chini is no longer with us. Um, this is Jacob Shen in Kalimpong, um, interacting with his students in Benjamin Garden School, which is run by his family. Um, yeah, uh, I think this is interesting. So, you know, I acknowledge that ethnicity is critical to thinking about the community's identity, but I believe a focus on ethnic identity alone obscures an understanding of other forms of belonging people's relationships to each other and place mm. um, and perhaps thinking about idea of identity or community itself. Mm. This here is the elevation plans for the Zangdok Palri Monastery in Kalimpong. Um, the principal architect of the project was Lai Ke Ahoy mm. and he's built many buildings in Kalimpong, mm. a self-trained architect and ethnic Chinese. In the book, The Boy from Kalimpong, his son Christopher Ahoy writes, that the monastery was one of dad's favorite design and construction projects. He was happy to add to other cre creations like additions to St. Joseph Convent, girls' schools, Hindu temples, new Kumudini home schools for Nepalese boys and girls, commercial buildings and go-downs for local clientele. Um, I mean, in, in this chapter, um, in this book, you know, he goes on to talk about his father's work for Marwadi traders. Uh, what's interesting again about this uh, photo is that um, what I learned, Tenzing Norge, who was the first to climb Mount Everest, was the general secretary of the association that supported the construction of the temple. So through these kind of uh, artifacts and narratives, you learn about, you know, people's relationships to the places they live uh, in. One thing that really comes out is uh, the range of different occupations the community is mm -hmm. associated with. Which mm -hmm. any you know when uh, when even I talked, I mean I talked about the Cantonese, the Hupe, and uh, Hakka and Shadong. We said that they were associated with certain professions, but here in your slides, you bring out that there are a range of occupations that they're so well integrated into our community fabric mm -hmm. wherever they are. So you know, I mean, I mean, architect, poet. So it's interesting. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll address that in more detail now. Um, and so this is Ashish Tham in, in the whole tea estate. And Ashish runs a grocery in his village in Assam. Mm -hmm. In fact, the day I met him and his brother Mithun, which was in a tea estate near Tinsukia, I think Madhvi mentioned some of the tea estates um, that was set up during colonial India, and this is one of them. Uh, Ashish was actually moving into his new home, and there was a Greh Pravesh puja taking place. And if I remember correctly, Ashish's wife is Bengali or Assamese. And, and so Ashish was dressed in a dhoti and performing all the rituals. Um, it didn't seem anything that was new to him. Uh, there was a pandit, you know, doing shlokas. At the same time, his brother Mithun was plucking chickens, um, you know, in another space to roast for the evening's dinner, which was going to be held in a 
um, traditional Chinese style. Um, and here I'd like to just, you know, touch on, you know, what Stuart Hall, uh, you know, he has two ways of thinking about cultural identity that I find useful. And I think I'll get to the professions from there. Um, first is a sense of belonging that draws on shared histories of community. This draws on similarities of experiences, including experiences of oppression and has fueled many anti-colonial struggles. For instance, in the context of the ethnic Chinese, we could think about the in internment camp and the shared memory of that experience. Um, but second, and this is what interests me, is a notion of identity that is more dynamic, relational, and always in a state of flux. This way of thinking about identity is important to appreciate the different experiences of peoples even within one community and to understand that identity formation is always an ongoing process. The latter approach also challenges any essentialized, fixed, authentic notion of identity that often pigeonholes ethnic communities in our society. I mean, the Indian Chinese is not a, homo not a homogenous community, is very diverse socially and geographically. And, you know, local experiences go a long way in shaping people's sense of self. Right. Um, here, this is Dr. Chang, who's a neurosurgeon and runs a super specialty hospital in Suliguri. Um, this is Jennifer Liang, uh, also part of the Desi Chinese Project. Um, she is a graduate from TIS and has worked in the Northeast region for, for over two years, uh, 20 years. Um, and um, Jenny is like a development professional. Incidentally, Jenny was also one of the original members of the Fa Mulan Dragon Dance team, mm -hmm. um, an all women's group. They were not initially, you know, there was some hesit hesitancy by some quarters of the community in kind of accepting an, an all women's group um, as it was considered ill luck uh, by some of them. But by the second year, all sections of the community welcomed them with open arms reflecting, and I think this reflects a change or, you know, um, shift in the community as well. Um, that's Charlie Ma, who's a Bharatnatyam dancer based out of um, Bangalore. Um, yeah, and this is Kohang Chang, um, a very well-known cinematographer, um, unfortunately passed very young. Uh, Chang was born in Kharki and grew up in Pune, where his family owned a photo studio. He graduated from the Film and Television Institute of India in 1977 and subsequently forged a very successful career as an ad film camera person. He worked extensively with the likes of Mahesh Mathai, Johnny Pinto, Nomita and Shubir of White Light um, Picture Company, among many others. For the people in the film fraternity, and this was really interesting when I was trying to, you know, uh, meet Chang um, or, you know, track him down, uh, that they were all surprised when I mentioned that he was seen as, as Chinese. Um, and I can say this, that Yun Chang kind of identified more as Maharashtrian or with, you know, his, his uh, identity as a Punaite than, than his own Chinese, than, than the Chinese identity. Um, again, I could show many more images of ethnic Chinese, you know, individuals and families across India, but I hope my journey gives everyone a good sense of the geographical spread of the ethnic Chinese, but also extends how we think about uh, identity and the idea of community um, itself. Thank you so much, Vidur. Mm -hmm. uh, Annie, would you like to comment on Vidur's presentation about how the community has gone out of its uh, little safety of the professions that they were normally associated with and gone into diverse professions as he's shown here? Yeah, you know, this these are the few who went out of the box. Yeah, not yeah, the usual the, one. They went. Yeah, they yeah. also because I think it's the interest and they had the opportunity to do it. Uh, like the the Mr. Chang, right? He was talking. I know him personally. Yeah, and he he was very successful. Yeah, mm -hmm. with but uh, and who else was that? Uh, the other other person that uh, poetry. Yeah, mm -hmm. writing poem. I suppose. Yeah, it's see at the end of the day, it's also what a person wants to do. Right. Not everybody wants to follow the same path like mm. the rest. No, so but they did, this, yeah. But is this true even in Bombay, in the Bombay community, people have sort of diversing into oh, yeah, we have one, yeah, we have yeah. another Mr. Chang, right? Who is Chang, yeah, mm. who's uh, who's one of the well known singer, okay. right? Yeah, uh, I don't know his first name, sorry. 
Yeah, but uh, I'm sure Vidhu knows him, knows him, right? So he's he's very popular with uh, Hindi singing. I think he even acted in a couple of movies. Yeah, he even okay. acted in a movie. And we have one from Delhi. He's into uh, he's into dancing. I think again he's with film. He's okay. with movies. Yeah. So we do have different, but not that many. Like we have nurses and some other in some other fields too. Yeah. Yeah, interior decorator, architect. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Annie. Uh, you know, I want to talk a little about the institutional and the built legacy of the Chinese in uh, here in Mumbai, the ethnic Chinese in Mumbai. So, uh, Annie, could you tell us a little about the Chinese temple at Mazgao? You've shared some wonderful photographs about it. When does the community congregate there? What are the festivals that you'll celebrate? What are the auspicious days you'll observe? Are there community institutions besides the temple that you'll have here in Bombay, in Mumbai? So, uh, and how does the community sort of network with each other? Yeah, see, that's the, that's the temple. Yeah, mm. that's the entrance to the temple, right. the Chinese temple. Mm. Uh, most of us meet during the Chinese New Year time. That's in mm. Feb, month of Feb. Oh, okay. right. Uh, so that's the time we meet up. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the main time when we all meet up. Right. Uh, and we have now, for the last few times, we've been having the dragon dance too outside. Okay. Uh, it, I think they come around 12 o'clock before bringing in the new year. Okay. And they have so that. it's uh, 12 o'clock at midnight. Yeah. So it's the oh. starting of the new year, right? Okay. 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 Yeah. And uh, the, uh, the day before the new year is what we call the family sit down dinner where the family gathers together and we have right. a, a proper banquet. So in Chinese, a banquet means a table with 10 dishes. Okay. Okay. We Chinese believe in even numbers. So it has to be even number. Okay. And in that we have to have all the meat we can think of. Mm -hmm. Fish is very important for us. Right. And then the noodles is for long life. So we'll have long lengthy noodles to have. Okay. Um, <laughs> And the fish, of course, bring prosperity and all and abundance. Mm -hmm. So that is one thing. Uh, and, uh, and also, of course, because it's a family get together, we all sit together and eat mm -hmm. a hearty meal. After that 12 o'clock, we go to the temple. Oh. And that's when we go to the temple to bring in the new year. So first thing we do is visit, visit God. Okay. Yeah. See, there. that's and, Tulan, my husband. Right. Right. And yeah, he's he's doing I think he's lighting the incense stick and the paper. Okay. And this is what they light and pray to for the for the new year, for the coming mm -hmm. year, mm -hmm. to bring good luck and safety and ha happiness and health, I I mm -hmm. think. And this is the stick, incense stick. That's my father in law. Oh. Okay. So that's the incense stick. Not sorry, sorry, it's not this. It's the stick that they have in a bamboo uh vase. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they move, uh, rotate it around, around mm -hmm. the incense mm -hmm. and the, and God. And what they do is after rotating three times, they start shaking till one of the stick falls off. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. stick has a number on it. There's right. a number stick. Right. Okay. After looking at that number, they go to the other, other place where the panel is kept of all the paper. I think you can move to the next slide. Yeah. That's yes. the one. So mm -hmm. you have a panel of different uh, papers attached to it. Mm -hmm. And on that, the number is there. So whatever is your number, you take that number, look for it. And in that, there, there, are, there are sayings and writings about your future, because that's what you pray for that year, okay. what your future holds for the year, for the new year. Okay. So in that, there will be, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like a fortune telling thing. Yeah. So it, they forecast your fortune for you. Uh, That's what it is. Yeah. yeah. And uh, is there any other festival? Because I don't know, I spoke to the present caretaker of the Chinese temple and she was telling me, he says, although the community is sort of spread across Bombay, I mean, they're no longer in the yeah. China towns of Bombay. That's he true. He says you get a huge crowd on Chinese New Year on that night. That's right. You know, That's congregating right. uh, there. Is there any other way besides Chinese New Year, any other festivals that you'll get together on, any other festivals that you'll celebrate together? Uh, we have another very important festival called Moon Festival. Okay. Yeah, but uh, it's not, we don't really meet meet, but uh, mm -hmm. sometimes we, we 
pass the cake around. It's a moon cake. Okay. okay. So basically, it's a cake made out of bean paste. Okay. And yeah, so that we give it to our relatives. And that's just like how we give Mithai in Diwali. So we do that. Yeah, okay. we have that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But does that also mean you visit the temple during that time or it's something done no. at home? You're supposed to, but we don't. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't. Oh. Not anymore. Yeah. Bombay is not as uh, into going to the temples. We, I think once a year is what we all do here in Bombay. Yeah. Yeah. Calcutta oh, yeah. is lot, a lot more. Yeah. Right. They, they visit more often. Annie, another question that really comes to mind is that all the people that I spoke to said that the Chinese cemetery on Antop Hill is mm -hmm. actually, you'll refer to it as two cemeteries because you'll believe in ancestor worship. That's uh, right. Can you explain that? Uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, see, in uh, uh, Antop Hill, we have two cemeteries, okay? Okay. And both uh, across each other. Uh, the mm -hmm. first one is the older one. So okay. in Chinese, we have this custom. What we do, we bury the person. And we leave it for, I think, three, minimum three years. Okay. okay. So once it's disintegrated and all, they have to go and clean those bones mm -hmm. and then put it in a vase and then rebury it in the older, older uh, cemetery. Okay. So from the new cemetery goes to the older one. Then you okay. make another tomb there. This is how it's done there. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And Annie, uh, uh, the people who've settled overseas and all, they do all because ancestor worship, I believe, is quite... Uh, quite big amongst the ethnic Ch I mean, amongst the Chinese. So you'll come back often during New Year's time to... Uh, sorry, sorry, I just want to correct it. No, yes. what they do is they... I made a mistake. Yes. What they do is they clean up the, uh, the bones and all, and then they put it in the vase and then they rebury it. There. Sorry, not in okay. the... Yeah, they don't take it to the other... Okay, other, okay. Yeah. So this becomes like a place where you go and you pay your respects. Respect, that's right. It, right, okay. because you have a tomb there. So right. that's it, yeah. Right. Uh, with now, what was the other question? No, and uh, does, I mean, the second part of my question was that uh, the overseas, I mean, a lot of the Indian Chinese have settled abroad, especially that's in Australia, right. Hong Kong, uh, Canada, America. So a lot of them keep coming to and fro during the New Year time and they do go up to the cemetery, pay their respects. They do come to the temple to celebrate New Year. So is this something that people do regularly or is it just... Over no, they do regularly because that's, that's the time that we all meet up, right? Okay. So yeah, yeah. And they try to come most of the time mm -hmm. during the Chinese New Year, yeah? During the Chinese New Year. Okay. That's right. Thanks a lot, Annie. That was quite uh, descriptive pleasure. and yeah. thorough. Uh, Vidur, uh, what about you photographed the community in 2006? And uh, you happened to photograph uh, the, one of the oldest Chinese restaurants being pulled down or you know, dismantled. Would you like to show us some of your Bombay slides? Because that would be interesting, Mumbai slides rather. Yes, uh, I'll, I'll show you some slides from uh, uh, from Mumbai. Um, okay. Yeah, I, you know, I, um, this was, you know, I just come back from China and I think I read an article in the Mumbai edition of Time Out um, on the Chinese community in, in Bombay. Mm -hmm. And uh, through some journalists who worked at the magazine, I, you know, they introduced me to Mr. Deepak Rao, uh, who very kindly took me on a walk around Shuklaji Street in the area around Kamatipura. And it was then that we stumbled upon Lokchun. This is a, a photograph of the exterior. And um, which was, you know, it, it seemed like it was being turned into a go down. Um, it had just been sold. And the workers had just started working, you know, uh, and but you could still see remnants of posters, um, you know, images of Chinese deities and Christ uh, on the walls. Um, the restaurant, I believe, was established, um, and and some you know some dated to 1895, some to later in 1935. Um, I'm not very sure of its antecedents, but this area itself um, it's still referred to as you know China compound because of the large presence of Chinese who lived there um, at one time. Um, yeah. 
um in fact you know any uh, the first time i visited bombay to make portraits of the ethnic chinese families i also met your husband mr tulan chen and we spoke about the chinese school in agripada which closed down um, after 1962 that's right hmm. and the efforts by the maharashtra chinese association to secure more land for the cemetery in wadala and i think he was talking about you know raising finances to build a perimeter wall around it um he also mentioned to me that most of the chinese who lived in central and south uh, mumbai had since moved to the suburbs to washi andheri vasai gorivili among other places um this here is dr yishao yi um and he was one of the few people i photographed during that visit um in 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 uh, uh, in, in 2006 um he's a dentist and you know he had a clinic in central bombay um i think he was the first dentist in bombay yes uh, i think he was the first to kind of uh, graduate uh, do his bbs graduate dentist uh, and, yeah. and kind of you know uh, went through a formal education um so yes i he i remember he mentioned that to me um uh, whether would you like to really mention here what uh, you meant by chinese dentists the old generation what were they really the difference between those who graduated and the older generation were known as teeth setters from hubei mhm there were you know there were people from hubei and um, they used you know different and perhaps more traditional methods that mm-hmm. they had learned um and and evolved over time uh when i'm talking about someone who's done a bds would be to kind of go through university and school like anyone else um i can't really get into the technical differences no, no, i'm two. not asking you no, i just wanted to draw that distinction yeah. because you mentioned here in this photograph that he was the first uh, graduate who had got from a, india yes yeah a bds uh, degree yes yes yes, yes. I, that's what he mentioned to me i mean i'm mm-hmm. um yeah perhaps in bombay i think um, i'm not yeah. sure again of that history right. um yeah and at, at that time you know when i first came in 2006 i was also looking for uh chinwin um uh was a photographer and i had come across chinwin's work in the 90s when i was in college um at st xavier's um and worked you know in advertising had an interest in photography and wanted to work with uh, you know photographers assist photographers at that time um and chinwin you know um so he did work with uh, he shot some of the center spreads for debonair um and this is an ad for um you know ask calling out for models uh chinwin was also very well known for a lot of his commercial work he worked in some really uh, prestigious campaigns uh he worked closely with adrian stevens uh, who was known for his work from the bombay dying campaigns and stuff so again uh, someone who passed very young and um unfortunately i've not been able to uh get in touch with his family or access his archives in fact if there's anyone in this audience who can help connect me to families or to to chimin's family in particular uh, i think or, the family is in canada yes that's I, i believe the sisters are there um that's what yeah. i was told um but if there's anyone in the audience who would you know uh, would like to connect with me i think my my details are in the bio and this is part of my dissertation project so i would love to kind of continue this conversation outside this space um yeah so and you know i'll i'll kind of show a small clip if that's okay um so if i'll stop sharing this and again i met someone during my first visit in bombay and any might know them uh uh was a it was a young lady who worked i think had some kind of connection with the ad world and she spoke to me about a day she spent working on the sets of gateway of india which is a film starring madhubala and this is a still from uh i think i stopped sharing so uh, let me kind of pull up uh, the song if you can hear that um ja tu hole hole Thank you. 
so that's very interesting. There's a you know a chorus um, in in Chinese in in, and it basically says you know you we welcome you to our land. You're happy. We're happy. Um, I, I think you know maybe Annie could translate that better <laughs> for us. Uh, but it was really interesting, you know, and and it's these you know small snatches um, in films, etc. You know, in in popular culture that I think are so important to fill the gaps or absences in in historical records, um, especially when it comes to marginalized communities like the Indian Chinese. Um, Annie, you mentioned Chang, the the popular musician, the singer and actor, uh, Mayang Chang, and I met uh, Chang. Correct, Mayang Chang. Yeah, you know, during my later visits to Bombay, and I think you know Chang, and I think his family is originally from Dhanbad or, or uh, somewhere in Bihar. Um, yeah, and 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 Chang, you know, moved to Bombay like many others to pursue his dreams uh, to become a singer, and I mean, I think Bombay is described as a city of uh, dreams, and people come to work here, um, and and you know, I think the movement of people and goods is both, you know. Madhvi mentioned in a project, and I think this is very much a part of that. I mean, Bombay offers many opportunities, especially if you want to work in films or, or in advertising. Um, so yeah, I think I think you know people move for all kinds of things. Um, but this was largely the extent of you know what I came across during my first visit to Bombay, and I'm hoping, um, Annie. I hope this will be the start, you know, the beginning of many more conversations with you. And uh, I would love to know more yep, about your sure. experience in the city. I might be able to give you the number of, uh, yeah. Yes, please. Okay. That would be great. Okay. Uh, you know, I'd like to come to Madhvi now because uh, we spoke about, uh, Annie spoke about the temple and the rituals. Uh, Vidur has spoken about the contemporary, now the internal migration that's coming back into cities like Bombay, where, you know, people are coming for aspirational reasons and settling here. Uh, so I want to talk to you about the material culture that came from China with the trade and which actually went on for a long period till 62. I mean, I'm talking about porcelain, I'm talking about silk, I'm talking about jade, ivory, teak. What was this? Because I know that on Bombay, I was, on Kulaba Causeway, I was told there used to be a Chinese a museum where the uh, cottage industry stands there, you know, in front of the BST depot. So can you tell us a little about this kind of material culture that, you know, that flowed freely between the two countries at one time? And it was very much there in Bombay. I mean, you see them in Parsi homes all the time. So, Madhvi, would you like to say something about this? Yes, sure. Um, as a historian, I always look at things historically. <laughs> so, <laughs> one of the you know interesting differences between this modern period and the earlier period is mm. um, in the earlier centuries, you know, a lot of cultural products and cultural influences moved from India to China, right? Actually, mainly through the Buddhism because of Buddhism and the you know, influences associated with Buddhism. But in this 19th century, you do see some um, Im import of Chinese cultural products coming into, mm. and that was really from Bombay, I would say. Okay. Um, and there are many, there were a few reasons for this. One is that, you know, as I told you, Indian traders went to Canton and they had to hang around for <laughs> three, four months of the year before they came back. So they all had to bring back something for their families. Mm -hmm. And um, Indians being what they are, especially fascinated by textiles, I think a lot of, you know, lengths of Chinese silk and Chinese silk embroidered cloth were brought back. Another reason is... Um, that the area where these merchants, Indian merchants lived on the water side in Canton, uh, in those areas, there was also a flourishing business of export art, what's called export art or Chinese export art. That is, it's not really traditional Chinese art products, but Chinese artists and craftsmen produced goods which they thought that these foreign traders would like and appreciate it. So instead, you know, this included oil painting and what is called reverse glass painting, uh, which is a kind of technique of painting, which is not traditionally Chinese, 
came from Europe, but it was adapted by the Chinese to produce portraits and landscapes of China, which they went back. And, um, you know, uh, of course, silk embroider, embroidered pieces and types of porcelain, China wear. And another reason, you know, was uh, that uh, opium, no, cotton and opium was shipped in huge quantities and there was not much that came back. I mean, there was, they really had to fill those ships. There had to be enough to fill the ships, holes of this huge ships that bore cotton to come back. And porcelain started to be imported into India as kind of ballast for the ships that, you know, it is a heavy product which could go in the holes of the ships and, uh, you know, could be packed nicely and brought back. So that's how a lot of porcelain items like huge vases and things started coming back. So these, this is the one way in which, uh, you know, Chinese cultural products started to come into India. But there's like the interesting part is what happened after that, because um, uh, these became so popular among ju not just the Parsi, but other, I would say, elite initially in Bombay and Western India generally. Mm -hmm. So it's not just Bombay. Right. That um, artists and Chinese artists and craftsmen were brought to India uh, mm -hmm. and Bombay from China. And so some of them actually set up studios, painters, you know, in Bombay, and they painted portraits of these families, and they actually lived here for a while. Uh, and uh, so that is one, you know, so you, you go from just importing Chinese products to actually having the Chinese art, artists and artisans come here and work. And then the third stage, which is very interesting, is you know, Indian um, craftsmen and artists start to ad learn from this and adapt those uh, things to, you know, uh, uh, to, in to their own work. So textile weaving, for instance, um, the, you know, you have heard of Tanjoi silk, many people would have heard, which we associate with Var Varanasi. Um, and, you know, we think it's an Indian product, but actually it's a type of uh, silk weaving that was learned in China. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story goes that Jamsechi Jiji Hoi sent three uh, weavers from near Surat to China to learn from this uh, Chinese silk weaving master called Choi. I mean, th there's no uh, sort of <laughs> proof of this. This is the story. And they came back and started this kind of weaving, which became very popular. And then Banarsi silk weavers adapted that. So this is, you know, one example. Of course, the famous example is the Gara, Parsi Gara saris, which... Right, uh, you know, which you showed on an earlier slide yeah. also. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so there was a rich powerful. cultural engagement between the two, cult uh, two, between the two civilizations in that mm -hmm. sense, through trade. Yeah. Yes. Right. Madhu, you'd like to add anything more here? Or um, about uh, in this, well, just that an interesting, while we're talking of textiles, but reverse glass painting, <laughs> you know, which I said already had come to China from Europe and was adapted to produce portraits. And so that was brought to uh, India and the Chinese artists produced, you know, uh, port portraits, reverse glass paintings of Indian, you know, individuals, notable individuals, but also Indian religious uh, portraits. So there were portraits of, uh, you know, Indian gods and goddesses. Mm -hmm. And I am sorry, I don't have the slide here, but earlier I had a, a slide of a couple of these paintings done mm -hmm. of supposedly Indian figures, but, you know, very clearly you can see the uh, Chinese, you know, uh, features of some influence of Chinese features on yeah. those portraits. Mm -hmm. And then this kind of reverse glass painting spread into other parts of India. And today's, you know, what you call the Tanjore, the famous Tanjore mm -hmm. paintings right. are reverse glass paintings. These are all, you know, uh, you know, they were, came from this uh, current of reverse glass painting that came through the Bombay trade. Oh. Yeah. So Bombay plays a very important part in this cultural exchange between the two. So uh, 
I'm now, I've left the best for last and that's food. I mean, food <laughs> is something we sort of associate with the, with our Chinese community here. And I wanted to come to Annie because Annie is really closely associated with uh, Chinese food because your husband, Tulun Chen, ran a uh, Kamling restaurant, owned it and ran it for so many, so many years. So uh, Annie, can you tell us uh, when did he get into the business and what was the kind of cuisine that he introduced us uh, Bombayites and now Mumbaikers too. Was it authentic Chinese cuisine? Was it spiced up a little, made a little sweeter to suit our taste? What were the dishes, iconic dishes that were served at Kamling? Uh, see, the Chinese, uh, the Kamling restaurant, Tulan mm -hmm. got it mm -hmm. from one of the seamen. Actually, Kamling is owned by the seamen, a group mm -hmm. of seamen who set up that place so that they have a place to eat Chinese food since they miss their mm -hmm. uh, regular, you know, home, mm -hmm. home cooked food. That's how they set up this place. Mm -hmm. And then during, of course, during Indochina war, mm -hmm. most of them went away. Right. Tulan helped one of the seamen. So that's mm -hmm. how he, the seamen left that, uh, sh his share to Tulan. Oh. And that's how Tulan got interested and got into restaurant. Otherwise, his family is not into restaurant business. I mean, they're all dentists, you see, okay. because, uh, because of, yeah. Being Hupe, I think they automatically get into dentistry. Right. So he got uh, this place, I think, when he just finished his 11th standard from Christchurch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he told his dad that I'm not studying any further. I'm going to get into restaurant business. Right. And um, so they started this restaurant. Of course, he bought that place. Uh, the father helped him to get that place from the, from, from the government. They bought mm -hmm. it on uh, an auction. Oh. That's how they got that place, yeah. And uh, I think in the 60s they started. The 60s? Oh. Yeah, early 60s. Uh, early and 60s. in the photograph, can you point out where Tulun is? I mean, his mother and father are there in the front, and his brother, which one is Tulun and which one is Dr. Henry Chen? Uh, uh, yeah, behind, uh, behind the mom. Okay, 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 okay. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, okay. Uh, I always get incoming call. Right. The, so okay, I, Annie. And what about the food that was served in uh, in Kamling? I mean, uh, can you sort of name some of the iconic dishes? Uh, tell us a little about the staff. Were they initially all Chinese? And but we want to know about the food because we all sort of grew up, you know, eating at Kamling. They are mainly serving Shezuan and uh, mm -hmm. these are the 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 first uh, set of staff he has. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, and yeah, they serve mainly Shezuan and mm -hmm. Cantonese. Shezuan uh, Shezuan Cantonese. is a little more, yeah, it's more yeah. spicier and mm -hmm. Cantonese is more milder flavored food. So it's more stir fries and all. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have some dishes that is popular with most Indians, like the spring rolls and all. Right, right. That was introduced. And Kamling is famous for their hot pot soup, which Tulan introduced. Okay. So that's like a, like a bowl of hot uh, soup. Mm -hmm. And then in that, you have all the possible meat and, uh, and noodles and all that. Mm -hmm. It's very popular with, uh, with Kamling. Yeah, it's one of their main dish i think yeah yeah and i was uh, reading an uh, interview with your husband actually it was yeah. an article on him and it said that he tried to keep the food as authentic, authentic as, as, possible, as possible rather than trying to adapt it to indian taste but he also had a keen uh, eye for the market because if there was a parsi clientele fee would be written on the slip and if it was hot, uh, sweet and sour, whatever, chicken or fish or whatever, they would make the dish a little more sweeter, sweeter. than it normally should be, you know. So, true, uh, true. but tell me, Annie, is the food very different, the kind of food that you eat in the restaurant and the kind of food you would get at home that you'll eat uh, at home? Yes, of course, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. This is, a, of course, we have to also adapt to the palate. Right. Of the of the customers, but no, mm -hmm. Tulan tried and stick to more of uh, authentic food. Yeah, he is, his uh, dishes are a little different from other restaurants because he believes that uh, if the food he doesn't like that food, I don't think it should be introduced. That's it. Okay, so that is yeah. 
Okay. Uh, just a question about your profession is why did so many why were so many Chinese women so successful in the salon business? I mean, you oh, are fr- you are really really successful in what you do. So, is there a reason for it? I mean, uh, it started long time ago. Uh, mm-hmm. Now I was told that the Chinese who came to this is much before the influx of uh, outsiders. The mm-hmm. Chinese that came in 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 the initial stage, the ladies, they didn't have a salon to go to and these are we are talking Chinese from Hong Kong and they're used to having the hairstyle they are used to threading and all they wanted these things to be done so what they did is they learned the art of how to do it and they came here and taught the Chinese who are immigrants in India and taught them how to do the threading how to do the blow drying how to style the how to put the rollers this is how the Chinese when they were very young, they got into this profession mm-hmm. as an apprentice. You know, that's how they right. learned. And then they mastered the art and they got into this profession. Then they realized that it's quite lucrative. Right. Uh, yeah, because uh, threading is uh, actually a Chinese um, uh, way of doing uh, cleaning the face. And uh, we Chinese believe that just before you get married, you have to get your whole face cleaned mm-hmm. up. And they, mm-hmm. threading was the only way they can do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Annie. I think I'm going to stop here because we are sort of running a bit over time. So I'm going to start with the questions. Okay. Um, there's a question that's come in uh, saying that uh, did the Chinese community here face any social stigmas during the pandemic? as seen in many Western countries. Now, I really don't know how true that is, whether they faced any stigmas, you know. Uh, I mean, you're uh, as Indian as anyone uh, else. India? I mean, no. No. Uh, no. Yeah. No. no I don't no, think that's, no. uh, that's true. No. Okay. Uh, anyone has, I think, Annie, probably you could take this again, is any suggestions for trying out authentic Chinese cuisine in Bombay? in Mumbai? Uh, yeah, we have now, now actually we have a lot of uh, Chinese restaurants that is, uh, especially of course in the hotels, mm-hmm. they, in, they get this uh, chef from China. So okay. you do get authentic Chinese food, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. which is very different mm-hmm. from what was earlier served? That's or? right. Okay. No, it is different, yeah. Right. Uh, Madhuri, I think this question may be more for you. Uh, in your research, have you come across, in fact, Thomas Timberg is asking this question, and he says, is there any Bombay Chinese list, list serve? Years ago, there was a newspaper in Kolkata. Well, I'm sorry, whether, is there any Chinese? Uh, is there a Bombay Chinese list serve? Uh, this... Thomas, would, would you like to uh, tell us what you mean by this? Do you mean periodicals, newspapers? Um, what okay. I yeah, I, uh, I really wouldn't know that. So, hmm. yeah, I haven't come across it. Okay. Uh, like I know that there are there were Chinese journals in Calcutta, Chinese Journal of India, for instance. Right. But uh, in my uh, work, I haven't come across a similar periodical if that is what is meant uh, yes. in Bombay but that is not to say there is there wasn't any yeah uh, Annie probably you may know because uh, as a child was there any kind of periodical or paper not in Bombay instead uh, my dad used to get the paper from Calcutta we used to have the paper sent from Calcutta to Mumbai because they don't have paper here okay 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 so that answers the question uh there's a question for Vidur, which says that having traveled extensively through India and China, and of course, the, uh, the person who's asking the question is at Tibet. I don't know, Vidur, if you've traveled through Tibet. Okay. Uh, what are the similarities in culture across the three countries? Um, I think culture is a really big word and I think very contentious. Um, and, and I think I can't put down something as being specifically Chinese or Indian or Tibetan. But in my encounters with people, um, people were often hospitable 
and and I think that was something that kind of stood out. Um, uh, especially when traveling through Tibet, we were in very um, inhospitable weather conditions, and I think it the, and and even through you know China, when I traveled across China and mm -hmm. I've traveled to Kashgar, that I think uh, Madhvi also mentioned in her presentation, um, people were always generous and very helpful um, through that. Um, I think this is a very broad question to answer, and I don't know how to approach it, especially when it comes to culture. I did want to touch on something that you had asked about whether the Chinese faced any discrimination during the pandemic. And my answer would be yes. Uh, okay. There is an article uh, by Liu Chen Chuen, who is um, an editor in the Indian Express, uh, talking about her experience uh, as Indian Chinese and in being kind of um, and I've heard this from other sources as well of people being called COVID or, and this is based on phenotype on the base of, basis of how people look. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, um, there, are, there are instances. Um, in fact, Chang, Mayang Chang had a, had a video um, on YouTube um, almost about a year ago where he spoke about his own experience of people, you know, calling him COVID on the streets of Bombay. So oh. uh, I would like to defer on that, that okay. point. So I do want to emphasize that. Uh, you yeah. know, I mean, I was actually, uh, it. I don't know if this was reported, but at least in the mainstream press, it hadn't really, you know, sort of uh, come out. And uh, I hadn't seen that uh, video that you're referring to. So yeah. yes, so maybe, you know, things like that are, you know, have happened and it's sad. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Madhvi, there's a question for you, and it comes says that uh, what are the similarities or differences you could point out between Chinese settlers in India and Indian settlers in China? Well, um, similarities is what I you know tried to point out that they came via the same routes and the same. Um, uh, <clears throat> ports uh, were the important ports for Indians going to China as well as mm. Chinese coming to India. Um, the differences, there are two I can think of straight out. Uh, mm. One is the that Indian policemen and soldiers formed a big proportion of the Indians who went to China and you don't find the same thing in okay. reverse. Right. And I think that's important because that had an impact on the perception mm. of Indians in China. Okay. Uh, so I know a lot of cases and it's come through in Chinese literature as well, mm. where the image of the Indian policeman, <laughs> not a frightening image, is um, you know very much in the consciousness of those who lived in the city, those cities where they were. So that's one difference, I would mm. say. Other thing is that uh, when um, some of the Indians who uh, settled in Hong Kong and Shanghai, and especially, they were really big, uh, became rather prominent people in the economic life of those places. So if you go to Hong Kong, I mean, the first time I went to Hong Kong, I was really <laughs> stunned by the nine, you know, roads and things named after. Uh, you know, clearly Bombay traders and mm. others who became established people. Uh, Kaduri himself, whom I showed the school, I mean, was right. one of them, but there are many others. Same in Shanghai, half of, not half, I'm sorry, I shouldn't exaggerate, but a number of the prominent buildings on the Shanghai waterfront, which is known mm. as the Shanghai Bund, were owned by the Sassoons and others. And, you know, it's mm. so, you know, this kind of. Um, place, uh, you know, in the economic life uh, of, the, you know, those big cities, couple of at least, two, three of the big cities, that I don't see the same thing. I think I'll stop. No, I, I just wanted to point out one thing we also have, and of course, you, you mentioned the Ellis Kaduri School, but we also have an Eli Kaduri School here in Mumbai. Oh. So, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. and they had uh, sort of donated towards the school building yes. uh, with this very famous uh, Baghdadi Jewish Hong Kong family. So they donated towards the school building at Mazgao, which is named after Sir Eli Kaduri. Mm -hmm. So that's a little Bombay factoid. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, Annie, there's a question for you. And the person is asking, is the attendee is asking, is that uh, Mrs. Chen, dental clinics, beauty salons, restaurants, and mahjong clubs are the ones that we know of. Have these businesses started? Are there businesses which started off but fizzled out over the generations? That means uh, traditional businesses is what I am uh, think. I think the person is referring to. Yeah, the salons is much less than what we used to have earlier. They yeah. are, uh, yeah, less in numbers compared to mm -hmm. uh, in the sixties and seventies. Yeah, but that's because the population has moved out. Oh. So the next generation is not even taking this profession. That's one reason. And mm -hmm. also they moved out of the country. That's another reason. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now talking about moving out of the country, I think the last question is coming from me, Annie. I wanted to talk about uh, how the ethnic Indian Chinese community in Toronto, because when we spoke about, and you know, we were talking about this uh, panel discussion, you, talk, you mentioned that, they maintain their connections with India greatly. They have special clubs. They have special programs. I mean, so yeah. can you just tell our audience how the uh, ethnic Indian Chinese community, how have they maintained a sort of an identity, an Indian identity in Toronto? Because I believe they're concentrated in uh, Scarborough and Markham. There. Markham, Scarborough. Markham, yeah. Markham, right. and Scarborough. Markham. Yeah, Markham. Okay, so can you just tell us how they sort of maintain their connections with India? What are the things that they sort of really keep in touch with? See, the in Chinese left India around 70s and 80s. Hmm. So that was the time, I mean, we are talking about the second generation of in, uh, Chinese Indians. So they are right. actually born Indian. Right. right? So that's why they, I think they are more Indian than Chinese. Mm -hmm. So once they went to Canada, it's not that you're going to give up so easily, you know. Right. So they're so into it. I mean, they love Bollywood songs. They love mm -hmm. Bollywood dances. Mm -hmm. They have these clubs where they, they actually have all these songs uh, playing. Mm -hmm. And they like Indian food. They love Indian food. Mm -hmm. And they dress up like Indians. So, and they, they sp speak fluent Hindi, Tamil, depends where they're coming from. Mar Marathi. So, yeah, you'll be surprised that uh, I would say if you don't look at them, you might think that they are Indians. Yeah. Okay. So I think we've had a great session and I'd like to hand over to Asad to sort of give, have the last word literally. <laughs> Thank you for all your support and to uh, the Gateway House for, for being part of this discussion, Manjeet and Ali Asghar. Uh, and lastly, to your audiences, I mean, you know, uh, this is the fourth in the series. I'm not sure we're going to find another diaspora we can we can uh, we can uh, spend so much time understanding. So it's been a wonderful journey, but we will have many more uh, sessions about uh, Bombay and Mumbai or if you need any more information just check out our website or stalk us on social media thank you very much once again and have a wonderful evening thank you